everyone to the first innovation webinar from CIB. My name is Mike Bean, uh, and I am the coordinator of WO99, uh, the Working Group on Safety and Health in Construction. Uh, this is the first, we're doing a trial, this is the first uh, webinar that CIB is uh, hosting. Uh, we have a panel of experts to talk about uh, using BIM to enhance construction safety and health. This is a very contemporary topic. Uh, we have three experts from around the world. I'll introduce them individually. Um, you'll hear uh, presentations uh, from them. I would ask that all of the attendees, and we have 97 registrants who have signed up, so we're very excited uh, about that uh, particular number for the first innovation webinar that we're hosting. Uh, we'd ask all the attendees, uh, we'll take questions and answers afterwards. If you could send them to me, Mike Bean, privately through the chat function um, within the webinar, and I will then pick one or two um, questions for each presenter after their presentation. At the end of all three presentations, we will have a uh, a, a panel and we'll try to take some more questions, engage in a discussion around this topic of using BIM to enhance construction safety and health. Tom, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, the, first, the first presenter, uh, here are the topics. We're going to hear about BIM and design for life cycle safety uh, by Dr. Ki Hong Ku. We're going to hear about promoting uh, construction site safety through some wonderful industry examples from Christina, Sue, and Kiwi. Uh, we're going to hear topic three, the last topic, BIM in combining productivity and safety, which, uh, so hopefully these are three um, topics that will synergize. Uh, we've ordered them in this specific way and hopefully that they will uh, synergize. So, um, Tom? Um, I believe we can go ahead with uh, Ki Hong's presentation. Ki Hong is an assistant professor at Philadelphia University. He has funded research from the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And um, Tom is going to begin the presentation. Thank you, Tom. briefly introduce myself and then talk about the research context, the main objectives and methods that we utilize, and then review results of the industry survey, uh, lessons from best practices studies and uh, results from a software study, and then discuss the impact area. I'm currently working as an assistant professor of architecture at Philadelphia University. I also have experience as a professor in building construction at Virginia Tech, also as a researcher and also an architectural engineer and designer. Um, and my research and teaching interests are in design technology and management that look at the impact of design technologies and also uh, into safety and design. And uh, one of my research projects has been funded by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, uh, looking into them for prevention through design. It is important to pay attention to the imperative of life cycle safety design, which has evolved in different countries in different ways. For example, in Europe, the Temporary and Mobile Construction Science Directive was initiated in 1992, which propagated into the different countries, including the UK CDM regulations. Uh, and in Australia, there, were, there was a corresponding development in terms of a uh, construction hazard assessment and location review. And then in the US, the National Safety Council Institute uh, initiated in 1995 the notion that worker safety can be enhanced through better design and design processes. Um, it's also important to pay attention to the broadening adoption of BIM, which is supporting integrated design that can help with uh, achieving high performance standards in user comfort, energy usage, life cycle impact, and design risk assessment. However, there is 
lack of knowledge on what prevention design tools designers utilize for safety design and subsequently how BIM can facilitate this process. We'll focus on the compatibility of design risk assessment and performance-based design principles and also look for opportunities of BIM applications that can facilitate this process. Design risk assessment is a process of design risk management which involves identifying hazards or hazardous activities and any associated risks relating to the intended construction work of building structures, maintenance, cleaning, operating, and so on. So um, part of the focus of this presentation is to understand how we map design processes for life cycle safety design and then um, also assess the needs for uh, different BIM tools. So the information that we're presenting in this presentation come from literature review, uh, expert interviews, and the broad industry survey, and then also case studies on best practices, and then software studies of commercially available uh, packages. To review industry perspectives on prevention for design or related concepts of safety and design, uh, we'll first look at results, partial results of, an, of a broad industry survey. Uh, the survey has been uh, composed of demographics, information, general design protocol, procedures, and BIM, and specific firms, prevention of the design, knowledge of the participants, and then standards and regulations being utilized at the firms and uh, tools and procedures for uh, considering life cycle safety design. This particular survey had a high contingent of viewers participants, uh, which were 69% of the uh, our sample was predominantly architects and engineers and also uh, senior level personnel in these firms. The majority of the participants indicated that they believe considering safety during design can improve uh, worker safety and health. When we ask about the familiarity with uh, concepts related to considering worker safety during design, uh, there was a sort of a different pattern between the different countries, the US, UK, and Australia. The US group showed that the architects were uh, not as familiar with these concepts. The majority was not familiar with these concepts. Uh, whereas in the UK and Australia, generally there was more awareness, probably due to the regulations that exist there. Uh, and also within the US, the other groups, engineers, construction managers, health and safety professionals, were generally more uh, knowledgeable of these concepts. It was interesting to see that the participants indicated experience with hazard identification uh, for construction safety, maintenance, and demolition. And also, there was actually a slightly higher percentage of experiences with construction safety than maintenance safety among architects. Um, and then, similarly, engineers, construction managers, um, showed higher experience in prevention through design, hazard identification, and risk assessment during construction safety. Um, these groups are aggregates of the three different countries, and so uh, the numbers here are slightly different per country. One of the questions asked about the usage of design tools for construction and maintenance repair safety. And as in the graph, we can see that code compliance checklists and material safety data sheets were highly rated within the US. Uh, this indicates that other tools such as design guides or hazard identification or checklists are not as um, available or they're not standardized within the US. Um, and so there is actually a need for development of these 
these types of tools um, to be provided to the profession. One of the questions looked at the mean effectiveness rating for design tools. Um, on a scale from one to five, the respondents were asked to rate the different tools. And in the graph, you can see that we can see that the U.S. participants indicated that code compliance checklists and prescriptive checklists were rated rated the highest, whereas in the U.K., design guides were uh, rated higher. Design guides tend to be more flexible and be, be applicable to um, other projects, many projects, whereas prescriptive checklists. Uh, tend to be more rigid and uh, not necessarily applicable to specifics of projects. In comparison to the broader industry, um, then a number of expert interviews and case studies were conducted to, ident to identify and define best practices. Um, it was being identified that design guides were preferred uh, versus uh, prescriptive checklists for the reasons of being those design guides being more flexible and uh, supporting the creative design process. Uh, oftentimes there are prompts that are being used in the design guide um, that would then allow design participants or team members to discuss and identify particular hazards. Um, there is also a focus on significant risk rather than uh, the greatest risk, um, and primarily on risks that are not obvious to competent contractors or other designers. And uh, another important part was visual communication, which utilizes simplified symbols and clear and precise communication protocols of hazards. And uh, another important part that was being utilized in this analysis was the design process mapping to understand the workflow and different tools and uh, techniques we utilize during different stages of design. So the following are a number of examples in different countries that uh, are utilized for visual communication, such as the uh, Master Safety and Health Plan in, in Germany. Or this annotated drawing with color-coded highlights and symbols developed by Scott Brownrigg Architects uh, to identify equipment and worker route access hazards. And specific design guides that relate to building systems such as the guide for cleaning of glazing systems um, that includes information on specific hazards related to geometric configuration, access, and support surfaces. Also, uh, particular case studies were uh, researched, investigated to identify implementations uh, in design such as the uh, Swinburne University's Advanced Technology Center designed by H2 Architects where the lighting fixtures were designed to allow uh, maintenance and operations access and skylight access from uh, the corridor balcony. Another method that's being utilized in this research is design process mapping to identify particular tools such as checklists, design guides, and visualization tools, and then also understand the workflow when these tools are being utilized and at what stages they're being utilized to uh, analyze gaps and uh, challenges in this process. And in parallel to identify potential applications of commercial thin tools, we uh, investigated rule-based a rule checker um, software, the delivery model checker, to see uh, which of the functionalities would support constructability, maintainability, and operability considerations during design. So this is an uh, example in Celebri that is uh, identifying access issues related to 
uh, the glazing system by using a rule for height checking uh, that could be utilized for cleaning of the glazing system. This just is this is an illustration of the two-dimensional distance checking related to openings and skylights that could be utilized to identify fault hazards. And this is another example of a rule, simple rule that's checking particular materials, in this case glazing, to identify uh, potential material weaknesses. So, uh, to somewhat conclude and to review the impact of this research, um, the first impact would be understanding the differences between best practices and the broader industry practices, and then identify which of the best practices um, could be applied and disseminated to the broader industry. And uh, the second part is understanding the shortcomings and uh, opportunities in terms of commercial BIM tool functionalities that could be utilized for considering constructability, maintainability, and operability issues that relate to worker safety. Um, and then the third part is to uh, define the design for safety and prevention through design workflows, mapping those processes and then identifying potential tools that can facilitate this process. So to conclude this presentation, um, the review of practices in the US, UK, Australia, and Germany illustrate gaps between best practices and general applications of prevention for design tools. And also, tools show potential for design risk assessments that apply to uh, rule-based checking of maintainability, operability issues, um, and then there are needs for design process mapping to guide BIM tool development. And uh, these areas basically also indicate uh, the need areas for further research. Okay, Kihong. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, there are a few questions um, that we'd like to perhaps, uh, if there's some more from the audience, please send me Mike Dean a private uh, text chat. But Kihong, um, you being an architect and your knowledge of architectural engineering uh, and the previous work you've done, could you talk about the future that you see specifically BIM aiding architects, uh, both globally, um, but also you referred to here in the United States where you're at, where there are no regulations. How, how could BIM help with some of the uh, data that you've collected in the future of um, construction safety and uh, safety through design? Um, Mike, so do you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so, as I um, as we found in the survey of um, asking the broader professionals, um, there is definitely a belief among the professions professionals that uh, considering safety during design can uh, enhance safety and health um, aspects of the workers. So, even though we don't have the regulations here, I think there is um, potential to engage the architects, the designers more in this process. Um, the architects, I think, uh, don't have the tools or the uh, the training right now. That's the, one of the biggest problems. But with BIM, uh, being able to incorporate some of the knowledge that's necessary to identify specific hazards, I think there is uh, potential to to help to help the designers who are not so familiar with this process. Um, I also think that the Focus of the architects will be more on the maintenance and operability side when it comes to actual hazard identification. But uh, with the tools, the collaboration with the uh, the contractors or the constructors who are more familiar with identifying hazards during construction uh, will be facilitated. And some of the uh, examples that we looked at sort of uh, have the potential to incorporate the processes that are involved in. Um, and uh, um, managing these types of risks. 
Kieran, thank you so much. The, um, I'm going to ask you one more question um, before we move on to the next presentation, and that is um, from the audience, how, how do you see construction clients or owners playing a role in promoting the use of BIM? Um, I think there is a demand from owners to become more uh, aware of health and safety issues. I think it's driven both by by the owners themselves, but also from uh, from the different professions that participate in the process. And um, while it's not currently a uh, broadly accepted aspect or perspective, I think with uh, with the larger attention to um, or with the larger awareness that BIM can facilitate not only uh, individual parts or pieces of the process, I think there will be eventually um, or there will be needs for creating new uh, guidelines and process maps and uh, policies that uh, show the potential of um, considering also the safety and health issues for workers and uh, bring them back into the process. And, and that probably will help to get the owners more on board. Thank you so much, Kihong. That's a great response. And in the essence of time, there's some more questions coming in, um, but we're going to try to take some of those at, at the end. Um, Tom, we're going to move on to um, presentation number two uh, is from Christina Sulankivi. She's a research scientist at the Technical Research Center of Finland, and Christina's presentation provides some industry examples and some work she's done in uh, Finland. And I think this will be a very interesting uh, presentation that uh, will, I think, uh, provide some answers to some of the discussion that's been going on privately to me. And thank you for um, for uh, participating. So. Um, Tom, we'll, we'll go to presentation number two, when you can. Uh, BIM, Promoting Construction Site Safety, Industry Examples by Christina Suankivi. Thank you, Tom. Hello everybody. I will show you examples how BIM can and has been used for promoting site safety. I'll start with BIM-based 3D site layout planning, which is currently the most common way of using BIM for construction safety. The other examples are related to BIM-based fall protection planning, to BIM-based construction, workflow, visualizations, and the last cases are more like examples of the future possibilities of BIM. All these areas which I am familiar with are at the same time examples of results but in research and development projects and examples of use of BIM in the industry. My first example of BIM-based site layout plan is a test trial made at VTT in our first BIM and safety-related research project. In this case, we made a BIM-based site layout plan using a completed residential building project as a case example. On the right, you can see the original 2D site plan which the contractor had used in the project. And on the left, the corresponding 3D plan made as a test trial and demonstration using Archicad 11 modeling software. Very soon after the demonstration, we carried out a pilot together with Skanska Finland, and in that 3D site plan was done at VTT for an ongoing industrial building project. Basically, the modeling tools were the same, but new BIM objects representing site equipment and 
material storage areas were needed. And new kinds of visualizations were tested based on a special needs of the project. In this view, you can see drive road for emergency vehicles highlighted with pink color. This was meant to underline that this path must be kept free throughout the construction project. However, this visualization representing risk areas on site in case of two different collapse situations was even more important and useful, since it's not possible to present and efficiently analyze the same thing in 2D. That's because the geometry of the risk area is so complicated. And I think the proof of the usefulness is that this kind of visualization has been used later again in a few other projects in Finland. My third plan example has been created using the class structures modeling software. Tecla was selected for the test trial since it provides more detailed and construction progress visualization tools than architectural software do, making more dynamic site planning and site status visualizations possible. We found also that site progress visualizations should be based on structural models since that's where the building parts from which the building is to be built are presented. And the last example is a BIM based site plan made by a Finnish contractor NCC using SketchUp as the modeling tool. As many of you may know, that's an easy to use and not too expensive tool either. But more importantly, I think this shows that the same kind of idea of visual 3D site plan can be put into practice using various BIM based software. And one can select the tool which he or she prefer. However, I think the selection of the modeling tool should be based on how and by whom the resulting model is aimed to be used. Another clear area for using BIM for improving safety is fall protection planning. In Finland, both site layout plan and fall protection plan are required in all projects by authorities. And in the figure on the right, you can see quite a good example of a traditional safety plan where different guardrail types have been marked into a 2D plan by different colors. And on the left, you can see an example of a detailed BIM-based fall protection plan made by EDT on behalf of a research project using project structural model as basis and SEQA structures as the tool for safety modeling. This case project was an ongoing construction project and modeling was based on the information got from the site manager concerning fall prevention solutions they aim to use in this project. This is an example of remarks they made when we presented the model-based plan to the site staff on the building site. In this case, they noticed that the distance between posts for this frame type would become too long since there is a big hole and the hole cover on the same line. And finally, they decided to use a different kind of post on this edge. My second example of team based fall protection plan is a quite new industry example. Modeling tools and the principles are the same as in the previous example, but this is made by Skanska in their residential building project in Finland. 
as you can see, safety modeling has been carried out covering the whole building. And in this closer view, you can see status in the model on a specific phase of frame construction. Planning has been carried out carefully, modeling all needed different guardrail types on all the edges so that the fall from height is prevented. And this other close view to the same model shows detailed pin based planning in staircases. This is already a normal procedure in Skanska, Finland, but in general, I think quite rare still in practice. And one reason for that is lack of suitable and easy to use tools for modeling. Third area where BIM can be used for safety is different kind of 4D construction, work order, planning and visualizations, including safety aspect. And my industry example is related to wall demolition work. On the left, you can see the traditional 2D plan made by the contractor, presenting the wall demolition pieces and the sequences. And on the right, the corresponding pin based plan, including the same parts in 3D, but instead of written numbers, the order was visualized as a simulation showing the process step by step so that the part being demolished was highlighted by pink color and after that hide it in the model view. This model view is from the first visualization test trial that was done for the lower part of the wall. Later on, the upper part of the same wall was demolished and another work order visualization was prepared for comparing two alternative sequences. First, you will see the bin based visualization for option A. It starts from the top of the wall. The part being demolished is highlighted by pink color and is hided after that in the model view. The visualization proceeds piece by piece in a specific order defined by the project. Stuff, but in this demonstration, I skip a few phases to speed up a little bit. The same structural model was used to make visualization corresponding to the option B. Just the order, which is defined by the class task manager, is different. In this option, demolition work is starting from the bottom of the wall. And proceeds again piece by piece in the order defined by the project staff. These two visualizations were used on site when the project team discussed and planned how to conduct the work in good and safe way. and both visualizations end to this kind of situation. I'll finish with two examples of future possibilities related to use of PIM for safety. Last year, we carried out research cooperation involving Georgia Tech from US, uh, 
and VTT scan scan Tecla from Finland, and we tested automated in based safety checking and planning using data from a Finnish construction project. We used Georgia Tech's prototype tool and Tecla structural model of that project to test and evaluate possibilities and development needs of automated planning. This test trial showed us that the prototype can create a rough fall prevention plan automatically and fast based on a bin base for the construction schedule. And the resulting fall protection plan can be flexibly corrected by a safety specialist. I would say that the tool and automating safety modeling procedures really own potential, but further development is needed before the tool can be used in real projects by construction professionals. Another clear possible direction is use of mobile safety data, as the use of mobile devices is rapidly increasing on construction sites. In this Finnish case building project, iPads have been used for weekly safety level measurement and filing safety observations, as shown in the figure on the right. The contractor Skanska has had a kind of pin stand there also, which is in practice a computer with a big touch screen display, providing opportunity for site staff to view models at field any time. I think that in the future, mobile devices such as iPads will be used for viewing BIM-based safety plans as well. For example, to check what kind of fall protection is planned to be used in a certain point such as that is. Thank you very much for your interest. Thank you for that presentation, Christina. There's a lot of questions coming through. I'm going to try to get to at least two of them. So if the audience can bear with me. Um, one of the questions is, with uh, there's two questions with regards to Skanska, Christina. Uh, the first one, being the client, um, how important of a factor is the use of BIM with Skanska being the client? Could you talk about that? I'm sorry, but I couldn't hear very well your question. I'm sorry. With Skanska being the client, how important of a factor was that with the use of BIM? Uh, in Skanska, BIM is very important, and safety is also. Does that <laughs> answer okay. your question? I know. Okay, from from Skanska's experience, does BIM cost money or save money? That's a difficult question. <laughs> I'm not the right person to answer to that, and um, so I can't really say. But I okay. guess there isn't really any calculations. But I'm not sure. I can't. I'm representing VTT, not Skanska. I understand. I, I think that's a really good question, and perhaps that's one of our um, areas for future research within W099. Um, a little long question here. Was any of the safety planning automated or supported through automation in the BIM? Uh, they go on to ask about were there any types of reasoning rules implemented? Uh, you do you mean uh, uh, well um and then they go on to ask would a simple three d model have worked just as well as bim I'm sorry, but I can't uh, understand the question um they're they're asking about the use of BIM compared to a simple, a more simpler model. In the examples, no. Uh, 
Hello? I lost yeah, you for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I think my screen saver was, <laughs> was working. So uh, I consider BIM is 3D plus information. And all what I uh, showed you, this is BIM, not only 3D. Okay. Okay, I, I will we'll try to get some follow-up questions um, at, at the end for Christina. We're going to move on to our third and our final presentation. This is Dr. Evelyn Tao from the National University of at, uh, Singapore. Um, Dr. Tao uh, is, uh, has funding from the Workplace um, Safety and Health uh, Institute in Singapore. Um, she'll be providing uh, a presentation on um, intelligence system for determining productivity and safety index using building information modeling. So this is our final presentation, and then we'll go into a panel discussion. I'll try to take some of the questions that I did not get to. Um, please keep the questions coming. Thank you so much. And Tom, we'll go to Evelyn's presentation. Hi. I'm Evelyn from NUS. Before I start, I would like to say a big thank you to the Mutual Fund Singapore for their funding and their support for this research project. Summary of my presentation introduction followed by background innovation education and impact of the We strongly believe that uh, it to improve productivity we have to reduce disruption of information in the design and construction stage. We also strongly believe that uh, to improve safety performance on site we have to use the integrated project delivery approach. We are using the open Singapore standards, BIM working guide, BIM technical guide, BIM management guide 
into the system. So as to ensure the quality of the beam, and we are referring to physical quality assurance, logical quality assurance, as well as data quality assurance. The first uh, module of the installation system is actually the productive module. It has the following features. So I'm going to show you a video to show how the first module of the system works. From the productive module of the integration system, the user can actually uh, see the actual process on site and also can do a comparison between actual and the planned program. So from the top, you can see the actual dates of, the, of each activity for the project, even the duration as well as the weeks that it involved for the various projects uh, throughout the entire uh, duration of the uh, project. This system also can help the user not only to monitor the productivity performance, it also can help the user to actually uh, monitor the cost of each trade for each duration for the entire uh, duration of the project. The second uh, module of this intelligence system is actually safety module, and it consists of the following features. So this uh, system can actually help the user to do risk assessment. Uh, they can actually help the user to do risk calculation, risk evaluation, as well as risk control. So this uh, the user can use this intelligent system to do evacuation simulation in the event of a fire. So uh, with this intelligent system, the user can actually know what to do during an emergency case, such as a fire occurrence uh, in the uh, project. The third module of the intelligence system is actually the QTO module and it has the following uh, features. So I'm going to show you a video of how this uh, third module of the intelligence system works. From the B module, the user can actually extract all the quantities from the B module. And uh, the system can actually not only help the user track the relevant quantities for each state of the items of the project, it can also help the user to actually produce the views of the quantity. So this is for us how a BQ can be produced automatically from the system. And this uh, BQ can be used uh, during tender stage, construction stage, as well as uh, to use this system for uh, progress payment, duration account, final account. And it also can be used to be sent to the relevant subcontractors for uh, the pricing and so forth. So this is the third module of the intelligence system. Uh, on top of the three modules of the intelligence system, we also have uh, databases whereby we captured all the cases uh, in the system and the user can use this uh, database to uh, look at the various accidents that occurred in the construction industry and we provide solutions to prevent how uh, a certain accident should be prevented. And we also can help the user by uh, helping them to do proper site planning. And also, they can use the intelligence system to do the actual uh, construction planning before the uh, project started. So, with that, I'd like to say thank you. And if you have further questions, you can just send an email to this uh, email address of mine. Thank you very much. Leland, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, one of the questions, Evelyn, um, has to do with the word intelligent, the intelligent system. The question is, what makes it intelligent? Could you talk about that, please? Oh, and Evelyn, your microphone is, is on mute at the moment. Uh, my mic is. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. 
thank you for the question. I would like to apologize for the very poor video and audio, uh, but I, I don't know what, what went wrong. But uh, the question you did ask was about what do we mean by intelligent systems? Is that right? Yes. What makes it intelligent? Uh, we term it as intelligent system because um, this system of ours can actually do uh, more than one task. It can actually uh, help the user to determine not only the productivity index, but also can help the user to determine uh, safety index. And it can uh, use the system to evaluate whether the site is safe or not safe. And uh, our system can also help the user to actually uh, do some self-monitoring and then provide them with some solution. So we, we view that as intelligent. Okay, thank you very much, Evelyn. Um, and in, in in terms of where, other than emailing you and asking some more questions, where where could they learn more about this system? Do you have any plans uh, for publishing in the future or some future work that they could learn from? We will the the intelligence system in the future, not now, because we're still uh, at a stage whereby we are, uh, you know still doing the project. So we, we have to uh, finish the project before we can uh, publish more of the details. But I'll be doing a presentation uh, next month in Sweden, and uh, I will provide more information there. Thank Just you very much. Yeah. I to, to consult my ministry for their parents. OK, thank you very much, Evelyn. Um, one final question for you. Is the safety index a scoring system to assess design? Uh, the safety index is actually not to evaluate the design, but to evaluate the performance of safety, whether how safe or unsafe uh, the site is. Based on okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to uh, go into the the uh, panel discussion, um, and I'll try to take some more questions for individual folks. Or uh, if they're for an individual, please let me know the individual. Or if they're for the panel, um, I will just ask them uh, in general. Bef before I do that, I want to thank uh, I want to thank our three presenters for their time and their expertise, uh, and and really going through this this first. Um, inaugural um, CID webinar, uh, and, and, and so their patience through this process and their technical expertise and their time uh, in, in getting up uh, in different parts of the world to, to, uh, to engage with us is just so much appreciated, uh, and I can't thank the three of them enough. I also want to thank uh, the CID Secretariat, uh, Tom Hablom, Wynn Backens, and uh, Peggy Van Ash for their help and uh, their support uh, and the, and the uh, continued discussions um, that we've had. Um, w 99 um, we, we certainly want to uh, be, be an active group. I've just um, taken over as joint coordinator with uh, Alistair Gibb of Loughborough University. And uh, Wim has asked me a question about how W099 could be more of a clearinghouse, not just on one webinar uh, on BIM and construction safety, but how we could engage more in uh, best practices. And that's a great question. And we are currently, we, we will be in the next couple of months revising a research roadmap. Uh, and we're having an upcoming uh, conference in Lund, Sweden, being hosted by Lund University uh, in June, June 2 and 3. And we're going to have some presentations on uh, BIM. We'll be having our annual meeting there. And we will be discussing the research roadmap in general, but also I think specifically this particular topic. Um, I think there's a lot of synergy with some of the other CID working commissions uh, and uh, task groups that we could be collaborating with, particularly on this uh, topic. Um, so. Um, We'd love feedback from all of the att attendees uh, at some point in the future. Uh, and there will be copies of the presentations. I see that um, coming in. 
Uh, I believe there will be some follow-up information to all of the attendees from the CIB Secretariat, um, where you can, ar you, can, you can view this as an archive and receive some uh, copies of these particular um, presentations. Um, one question for the panel, and uh, I'm please let me know which one of you would like to uh, take this. From a technical point of view, what additional um, technological advances does it have on top of BIM, on top of BIM-based modeling? If that question, if I can clarify that. For any of our panelists, Kihong, Evelyn, or Christina, from the technical point of view, what additional advances does it have on top? So I think the question is uh, what additional advances uh, BIM brings to the table here. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's actually uh, partially a or uh, largely an organizational advantage that could be brought to the table. For example, there are a lot of uh, barriers, uh, perceived barriers, and then also liability, legal barriers. Um, but with BIM, sort of um, tackling the issues that are more relevant to each profession. For example, when I talked about the architects, it's more about maintenance and operability, which is already an area that's being considered. Uh, it broadens and makes it more um, and more efficient or more approachable to consider these issues. So I think it actually will potentially bring also uh, a lower the organizational barriers that exist in the uh, consideration of safety. Because safety or health are being considered um, in design for the general public and for the users when you think from the design standpoint, but not so much uh, for, the, for, the, for the worker side. Uh, but by sort of bridging this gap with this new technology, I think it's lowering the organization barriers potentially. Okay, thank you, Kihong. Thank you. Here's a question about construction clients. In some countries, in some countries, construction clients have a formal responsibility for safety and health on site. How does that influence this topic? Christina or Evelyn? I, I think <laughs> yes. I have one one idea. I think the client ha is in such a position they can ask or even require contractors, for example, to present in base plans. Because I think use of BIM improves the quality of safety planning and makes it more carefully and also makes those plans easier to understand. Okay. Great. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Um, there's, I think there's a question for me. Um, one of the participants has been reviewing the um, fatality assessment reports that we produce here in the United States, and they now have a safety through design factor included in them. Um, the question is, could they be integrated as prompts into a BIM model, and I think that's that's a great idea to kind of analyze some of those uh, accidents and perhaps use them in a prompt. That's that's a great idea. Um, another question is um, on specifically on topic one. So Kihong, I believe this is for you. Uh, do you believe that in the future the government the government and institutions will provide BIM-based rule sets? Such as the solibri sol ones instead of paper guidelines. I think that's a very good question. I think the um, uh, some of them may be easier to integrate as guidelines or rule sets. For example, OSHA has a rule set that they are very prescriptive uh, in terms of nature of uh, certain. Um, uh, platforms that are above the height or uh, needs for guardrails, uh, but I think there's also a, a challenge in terms of what rules can be uh, 
established that relate specifically to to design problems or design issues. So in the area that I have been looking into, it's easier to find rules for maintenance and operability issues uh, than for construction issues if it's from a design perspective. So um, it, it's a good question, but I don't think there is an immediate kind of uh, uh, way to create a universal rule that applies for worker safety that applies during design. Uh, applies during design. Thank you so much, Ki Hong. Thank you. Uh, we have another question for all the panelists. How can we make this accessible to small contractors? This is when a question say, for uh, any of the panelists. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Mike, when you say uh, how can we use this, are you referring to BIM? Yes, yes, the, yes, the topic, yes. How do we make BIM accessible to all, to small contractors? I guess uh, BIM is actually very useful for especially SME because uh, if you are a small company and, and you have limited resources, and manpower, B is actually a tool whereby it can help this uh, SME to actually be more competitive. This is what I feel. And, and uh, how can it be accessible to this SME? It is actually, um, like in Singapore, our government is very uh, helpful whereby they provide BIM funding for people, whether the SME or big contractors. If they wanted to adopt BIM, they can always apply for the BIM fund. Great, thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, do any of our other panelists have a have any comment on the small contractors? I know here in here in the US and certainly globally as well, we uh, we tend to see higher injury and fatality rates with our small contractors and getting best practices and new technologies to them is always um, always a challenge and I, I think um, you know, working with larger uh, organizations to develop these best practices, but then integrating them to uh, the subcontractors that might be smaller uh, contractors, and and uh, more generally in uh, the local uh, community, um, is always a challenge. And and I think that's a that's a great question. Great question for us to think about. I think the uh, it's. Like you said, there is an overhead when it comes to implementing BIM, and especially at smaller organizations. Um, the the benefit of implementing those though is that it could uh, create because one of the advantages of BIM is that it uh, builds objects and libraries, and so you can sort of set up your own rules and your uh, standards in the BIM environment. And once you set them up, I think it will streamline the general productivity of, of your particular processes. So I think there is some advantages of that part of incorporating the knowledge that's uh, specifically re relevant to that smaller organization. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ki Hong. I appreciate that. Well, um, Tom and Lim, I believe we've come to the end of most of our questions here and we've been going a little over an hour. Looks like maybe one more question coming in. We'll take one more question. Um, are today, and then we're going to close the discussion I believe, are today's iPads suitable for displaying BIM on site? Can you please repeat the question? Yes. Are today's iPads suitable for displaying BIM on site? Short answer is yes. The short answer is yes. Thank you. In Finland, there is experience of using iPad at site, and the first experience is very good. But all, um, I think one one limitation is that 
the models can't be very big if you want to bring it and view it in iPad. But, but first experience we had in Finland are very good. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Evelyn. Thank you for those responses. Well, I think this seminar was very informative. I, I know I hope to learn more about this topic. Um, and again, we've had, I hope the attendees have enjoyed our three experts uh, in this area. I hope they want to learn more and engage more with BIM and seeing how it can really truly affect site safety um, and help our workers and our organizations. Um, again, um, the CID Secretariat will be communicating with all the attendees uh, on how to access the, some of the slides and the presentations and this particular uh, webinar. I want to thank uh, again um, Kihong, Christina, and Evelyn for their time and their expertise uh, in conducting this first inaugural CID Innovation Webinar. And again, I, I want to thank the CID uh, Secretariat uh, specifically Tom and Wynn and uh, Peggy for organizing this uh, and helping us um, deliver. We hope that uh, it's been beneficial for the group uh, and also beneficial for CID and, and just the, the uh, construction community at large. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn it back to the Secretariat if there's any final comments. Mike, thank you very much. This is Wim Baken, Secretary General of CIB. Thanks, Mike, for uh, your convenership. You made it a very lively event uh, for all attendees. Uh, thanks for attending. Uh, do know that we have a next CIB Innovation webinar exactly one week from now uh, on low-income housing in Indonesia, examples of new concepts, same starting time. And there will be other ones uh, that are now in uh, preparation on the best value concept in the U.S., the best value concept in the Netherlands, and open building in the Netherlands. If you have downloaded the app that helps you to install the CIB Innovation Journal, you will be informed of all of that. If you do receive the CIB newsletter, you will receive all the information. I hope that in addition to this webinar and its presentations, you have been able to uh, look at the innovation reports that we provided on the three different topics. They include many links to uh, uh, more additional information on those topics. And with that, I would like to thank Mike and the presenters, Tom, the Secretariat, and all attendees. Thank you very much, and hopefully see you again in a week at the next CIB Innovation Webinar.